And now we are going to talk about the warrior's heart, Joshua chapter 1. And uh, we've talked a lot about the different, I've preached a lot of messages on the heart, and I don't know if you've heard some of those, but go back and listen to some of those if you haven't heard those. But uh, a good series on that, just kind of looking at our heart and what the Bible says about that. And, you know, I want to talk to you about the warrior's heart. The Bible says, In Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and under the great sea toward, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Amen. He said, be strong. And of, good, and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be, be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Let's pray. Father... Oh, by the way, you know, let's pray. Father, Lord, I I just pray that you be with us now. Help us, dear Heavenly Father. We need you, Lord. We need to be strengthened by your word. Lord, we need it every day because the devil hates us. This world hates us, Lord. And we know we're on enemy territory. But you promised that wherever the soles of our feet would tread, that we would tread upon, Lord, that you would help us. You would give us strength. You would protect us. You would keep us. Help us, dear God, to fight your battles and to have a warrior's heart, to be strong and of good courage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, Joshua, he had a warrior's heart. He was a warrior. Joshua was a warrior before he was a leader. Remember, Joshua was a a servant before he was a leader. He served Moses, but he was a warrior still. He was sent into Canaan to spy out the land. Ten other men said they couldn't do it, right? Ten other men said they couldn't do it. Don't ever be the man that says it can't be done, that God can't do something. Don't be that person. Don't ever be that person. Don't be found among those ten. Be found among the two. You don't want to be found among the ten. If God sets you out to do do something for Him, then you believe Him and you go and you do it until you're dead. Amen? Don't turn your back. Don't turn. I'm going to tell you what, when your heart turns around, when inside your, before your, long before your feet go, your heart turns. And once your heart is turned, once your heart is turned away and you don't, and you don't follow through with what God has sent you to do, it's not too long before your feet go. Because once your spirit is so wounded and beat down and broken, you won't continue on for the Lord no matter what. But like I've said before, there are men that have been smitten in their flesh, their flesh destroyed, and they, they, you know what? They would hobble to it if they had to. They would crawl to it. You take their legs and they'll crawl. They'll, do it, or they'll, they'll, they'll use their arms and they'll push with their arms all the way. They won't give up. And that's what God wants out of His children, never to give up, never to turn around the other way, never to go back, but to, to press forward. That's what God wants from His children. Ten other, ten other men said they couldn't do it, right? But what's the Bible say about Caleb and Joshua? Caleb and Joshua, they had another spirit. Caleb had another spirit. They were warriors. They had no quit in them. They had that cloak of zeal and they were ready to storm in there and destroy some giants. You know, listen, listen to me. Your life is about destroying giants. That's what it's about. As a child of God, as a child of the king, you will forever be slaying giants until you're home. Amen. 
Do you understand that? Whatever those giants may be within, they may be without. It doesn't matter where they are. But you will forever be warring. You will forever be warring and trying to slay giants in your life and slaying giants in your life. You will forever be doing that until you're on the other side, until you war no more. But while we're here, this is a life of war. It doesn't matter how old you are. He's 72 years old. It doesn't matter. He still has to war. He still has to fight every day. Inward fighting and outward fighting. Amen. Both. You have to do it all the time. You can never give up, never back off, always pressing forward. You know, <clears throat> Caleb and Joshua, they could have cared less about the sons of Anak. He said, all those men said, well, hey. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. What happened? Well, first of all, they, these, these ten men, they forgot how big God was. I'm going to tell you something. You want to see failure come? You forget how big God is. You go ahead and keep your eyes on your puny little self, and yeah, you are an ant. Big deal. God never told you you are going to take the land. God never told you you are going to be victorious because you, because you were mighty. No, he said you would be victorious in him. In Christ, all things are possible. In Christ, we have power. The authority and the power comes from the one who sent you. Not you. Let me help you. We have never been anything great, and we never will be anything great. But we have a great God. Amen. That's the difference. Numbers chapter fourteen, verse number six. Turn there. Numbers chapter fourteen. As we explain this, I, I'm, I'm just. This is like the introduction here. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. What happened? All these people are telling them, we can't do it. We can't do it. We can't, we can't take the land. We, we, we're never, we can't do it. Wait a minute. So God sent you in there to go spy out the land because you couldn't take it? What was that for? Why would God send you into somebody and say, well, you're going to utterly fail and all these giants are going to squash you like a bunch of ants. But hey, I'm going to send you there anyway. Well, why would he do that? Well, he wouldn't. He already promised them that. The strength is, but listen to me closely. The strength is believing the promises of God, not your own steadfastness. The strength is following and believing God. It's faith. It's nothing else. Right. It's not us. And there, there we saw the, the giants, the sons of Anak, right? And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. You know what? When you stop trusting God, you know what it is? It's rebellion. Because look what he said in verse number 9, or verse number 8. And if the Lord delight in us, he will, he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Listen, when you and I don't trust God, when we don't believe God's promises, we are actually rebelling against God. We've rebelled against him. And they listen, they all got a company of people together, all ten of those, ten of those people. What'd they do? They had everybody murmuring and complaining. Man, they had everybody scared and worried. Where was there? It was the same thing that David walked into. When David walked into the camp of the Israelites. He said, his dad said, go take him some cheese and some food or whatever, some bread and some cheese and all this. Go take it to your brothers and see how the war's going. Okay. So he walks into the camp and what's everybody doing? Shivering and shaking. Saul's in a, in a, in a ball of a mess underneath the tree. The Lord's anointed is sitting underneath the tree, all balled up and afraid. What's David do? David just walks in and says, what's going on? He's looking around at all these people and he's like, well, see that giant over there? He's defied the living army, the God, the God of Israel, and the, and, the, and the armies of God. That's what he's done. And the king said, if, if we find a champion, wait a minute, why ain't the king the champion? What happened to him? He was scared. He didn't have the power of God anymore, right? 
He was like Samson. He wist not that the Lord had departed from him. So he's over there sitting there in a tree. And what's David doing? David is a warrior. David's like, yeah, I mean, I, I took care of a lion. I took care of the, the bear. I mean, I, I've done all this. He's like, well, here, take this armor. No, I don't need that armor. I don't want that. I haven't earned that. Yeah, I haven't proved it. I don't need it. Just give me the, give me the, give me my sling, and I'll go out and do it the way that God always had me. Just plain old, his plain old sling, right? Just give me my plain old sling and some stones, right? What did he have? He had a warrior's heart. He believed God. But he said to these people, he said, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Look what he said. Look what Joshua said to them and Caleb. For they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. What did he say to him? What was the charge that he gave him back in Joshua? Or what, what he gave him? Be strong and of good courage. He's always given that charge to Moses. He said, be strong and of good courage. Take a, you're going to go take the land. Be strong and of good courage. I've already promised you this land. See, that's why they roamed around in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. You know, there's a lot of people that don't trust God, and they end up in the wilderness for a long time. Yep. These men were warriors before they were leaders. They were part of that scouting mission. But I'm telling you, Caleb and Joshua looked at those giants and said, let's squash them. Let's just destroy them. Let's go in there. Let's take their heads. Let's cut them off. Let's kill them. Let's take the land. Why? Because they believed God. That's why. They knew that they were called of God to do a work. They knew that God had sent them to do a work. God sent them into the land to spy it out. Here, spy it out, come back, and then we're going to go. You're going to take it. That mission was supposed to be one of the greatest blessings that Israel ever had, and it ended up being a curse to them because of their rebellion. Do you understand that? That that that, that was supposed to be just a scouting. Like, look at all these. Look at this fruit. Look at this land. Look at what we have from this land. Look how good this land is. Well, that's what Joshua and Caleb thought when they went in there. They were like, look at all this good of the land. Look at this, the land that flows with milk and honey. Everything God told us was true about it. Everything God said was true. We've never seen it before, but we've seen it right now, and God said it was good. Look at everything. Look how wonderful it is. But that's not the way the others seen it. What do they see? Oh, there's giants there. Can I help you with something? There's going to be giants everywhere in your life, always. Every day you wake up, you're going to face another giant. And you and I can handle it one or two ways. We can go cower in the corner and suck our thumbs and act like a bunch of babies, or we can get up and fight. And we can do what God wants us to do. We can go in the power of the Lord and trust the Lord and have that other spirit, have that warrior's heart that they had. And these guys were like, let's destroy, let's cut their heads off. That's how you and I have to look at the devil's kingdom the same way. Yeah, they're everywhere, but you know what? We've been given power and authority. Now go use it. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Man, that was his spirit. He said, Let's go, man. We are well able to overcome it. He knew it. You know, you would think 40 years would have cooled off Caleb and Joshua, and they would have lost some of their zeal, right? For cha- you know, they, they spent their time in the desert, in the wilderness, in the desert areas, and all this other stuff, chasing around scorpions, you know, in the desert. I mean, just living, you know, awful. I mean, just, it was a horrible life, right? But you think Caleb, right? You think Caleb probably forgot about that, right? He probably didn't think much about that during that time. No, I think Caleb was like, I think for 40 years, Caleb was like thinking about it, like, man, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to chop their heads off and get in there and take my land. I can't wait to go. You see that mountain over there? I can't wait to take that mountain over there. I can't wait for it. Imagine how, how good of a spirit Caleb and Joshua had to have because of everybody else. They had to go through the wilderness. But Caleb, you would think Caleb would be discouraged. No, Caleb wasn't discouraged. Caleb was like, it's about time. I'm ready to go. Let's go. So turn to Joshua chapter 15, and you'll see the first thing Caleb does as soon as he gets a chance. 
He didn't let time cool his zeal off any. Joshua chapter 15, verse number 13. And to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. Now that's an interesting... Arba is an interesting man, and so is uh, the father of Anak and all that stuff, but I don't have time to go through that. Joshua chapter 15, verse number 14. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahimon, and Talmai, the children of Anak. He drove thence... Those three. So that's the first thing he did. Do you understand that? Caleb's waiting all this time. What's the first thing? Oh, he, he probably wanted to avoid those giants, right? Oh, just give me this land over here. No, Caleb's like, yeah, you remember those giants over there? Yep, I want them. I want them. That's what I want. Right? Caleb had a warrior's heart. They said, but there's giants in the land. Caleb's like, I know, I want to kill them. I know. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We understand the battle that we face. We have to understand that we've been given the victory. You know when you lose the victory is when you stop fighting. When you turn around and go the other way, that's when you lose. When you turn your back. When you turn your back, you're not fighting anymore, and you're going to get consumed. Caleb and Joshua, they had the heart of warriors, though. By the way, we need some men today that have the warrior's heart, that are ready to war, Amen. men of war, spiritually that are ready to go take the land, man. They're not, they're not going sac- to let one inch of ground, Satan have one inch of ground wherever they are. Yeah, that's right. Give him no place. So number one, by, oh, by the way, let me say this to you. Caleb and Joshua had the heart of a warrior, and because of that, it became contagious, and you'll see that. Um, as I show you some scripture here, um, turn to Numbers chapter 32, verse number 12. The warrior's heart is one that is holy, follows the Lord as God. Holy, that means completely, his whole heart follows the Lord. So that's number one. If you want a warrior's heart, it's a heart that follows, wholly follows the Lord their God. Numbers chapter 32, verse number 12. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Ken- Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord completely with a perfect heart they followed god that means there was no question about it they didn't have they they didn't they weren't halted between two opinions they knew what god wanted them to do and they followed him completely with their whole heart they weren't they weren't ready to give up something to the world they weren't ready to make a compromise with the devil they weren't ready to make a compromise with the world or with family or with anybody else they said nope my heart is going to wholly follow the lord my god Amen. with a complete heart Everything. Caleb and Joshua had hearts that were fixed on the Lord. They didn't care if those men were 40 feet tall. It didn't matter. They didn't care if the sons of Anak were there. They didn't care if the sons of Anak hated them. God had promised them wherever the soles of their feet treaded, he would give them. If the devils came or the giants came, or angry people came. It didn't matter. That same promise is given to you in Luke chapter 10, verse number 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Do you see that? Over some of the power of the enemy? Over a little of the power of the enemy? No. Over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Over all the power of the enemy, that's what God has given his people. Just like he promised Joshua to give them, God has given that same promise to you today. Joshua chapter 1 verse number 3, Every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. But you've got to have a fixed heart. Joshua and Caleb, their heart was fixed. Psalms 57, 7, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. What does that word fixed mean? It means settled, established, firm, stable. I'm fixed, Lord. My heart is fixed. It's wholly and completely fixed on God. 
on obeying the Lord. It's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. No one ever did anything, no one ever did anything uh, extraordinary for God that their heart was not wholly set to do so for the Lord, that they weren't fixed on it. They had to be fixed, their heart had to be fixed, established, firm, fast, stable, not wavering, nothing wavering. Their hearts were completely fixed on God. You'll have a warrior's heart if it's fixed on God. You know, Caleb didn't care about the size of the giant. He knew the size of his God. That's one of the problems today. When anybody wants to do a work for God, if you, you know, if you think you're going to do something for God, the one thing you have to understand is that God is bigger than everything. And if he wants to make something work, he'll make it work, whatever way he wants to. And it'll defy the logic of so many people. The scholars... It'll defy their logic. That King James Bible disguise and def- uh, it, it defies the logic of the scholars. Makes them look like a bunch of fools. It shuts the mouth of fools when God does a work. When God takes humble men, when God takes men and he takes them and, 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 and they don't have everything that everybody else has and he uses them for his glory, it defies the wise. The worldly wise look at that and be like, but I have everything. I, I have everything that I, I need. I, I know I'm organized. I have all this stuff perfectly this way and that way. You know what? Doesn't matter. Sometimes you can, have, you can organize God right out of something. Telling him you don't need him. When God speaks to you, you just keep going. You don't listen. To, you don't listen to what He says. You just you just do it your way. Yeah, it is. Listen, I don't care about how many enemies we have, nor who the president is, nor how much they hate this ministry, and didn't want this church in Northfield. It's the size of my God that matters. You understand that? It doesn't matter. God has defied all of them. I said, okay, you won't receive the message. Okay, I'll send people from outside. I'll send it from outside and I'll build a church right underneath your nose. Right? Right underneath your nose. I'll do it right in front of your face. Right in the devil's place right here. In the most liberal town in in Minnesota. With two liberal universities that are a bunch of God-hating, wicked devils. Amen? Mm Mm-hmm. Why? Because God's bigger than anything, any problem that you can run into. And God gives that warrior's heart to his his people. But they have to be fixed on him. They have to be wholly fixed on him. Lord, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to follow you no matter what. My heart is fixed on you, oh God. I'm not not going to turn around to the right or the left. My heart is fixed on you. What did he say? He warned of this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Why this book? We follow this book. Amen? Amen? And then you'll have success. You don't follow this book, don't expect success. Because you won't have it. You ignore what God says in his word, you're not going to have success. Won't have it. Number two, the warrior's heart is a sanctified heart. Amen. It is a sanctified heart. If you are a warrior, then you, then your heart. If you are if you are battling the Lord's battles, if you are a soldier of the Lord's, and guess what, your heart has to be sanctified. Joshua chapter three verse number five. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. But what did he say? Huh? Sanctify yourselves. You want God to do wonders among you? Well, if you're not holy, if you're not separated unto God, if you're not sanctified unto God, why would God want to use you? You know, we have a, there's a lot of churches today that have a lot of activities going on, a lot of things going on, but they have no power. Why? Well, because they have a bunch of dirty vessels that are doing the work, and nobody wants to live for God and be clean and holy and separated and righteous unto him. They don't want to abstain from all appearance of evil. They don't want to turn from the sin, but they want to embrace the sin. So most of them here can't wait till the Super Bowl starts, right? The stupid bowl. They can't wait for it to start. Right? A waste of life. 
bunch of dirty, defiling, wicked commercials that are shown on there, advertising for beer and everything else and liquor and everything, every other sexual innuendo and every, every wicked thing imaginable on there. That's what they want to, and, and some of God's people there, and I believe some of these people, a lot of these people are saved too. And that's why you see the judgment of God on this country, because the saved people are living like the devil. That's why. And they can't wait to get out there. Instead of standing outside of all these games with 40, 50,000 people, what are they doing? Going in and participating in it. Right. Going in. You know what? I don't think there's an, anything inherently evil about baseball or football or any of those things. Well, maybe football because it looks gay. But anyway. Um, but, um, I mean, just wearing, like, yoga pants and out there, it's just really weird. I, don't, I, don't, I don't, just don't understand the attraction to that, really, to be honest with you. But Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and child trafficking at the Super Bowl. Yeah, all those things. But you look at it right now. They can't turn from that. There's so many people that are so addicted to those sports that they cannot give it up. They're like, man, I can give up a lot of things, but I can't. I really, I really like my sports. You've got to pray for me. I really like my sports. Really? Well, what are you battling? I mean, seriously. I'll tell you what will make you not like it. Here's what will make you not like it. You all want to like sports? I'll tell you what will make you not like it. Come with us. And go out in front of those sporting events and watch him curse your God. Amen. Then you'll be like, well, I don't want to go in there. Come see these fine sports fans that come out and throw our banners around and punch us and push us and, and kick us and spit on us and everything else. Then let's see if you still love that. See whose side you're on. Are you on the side of righteousness and truth? Or are you on the side of this wicked world and the stupid bull? Don't say it like that. Say it nicer than that. I know. Because then more people would listen to me if I said it nicer, wouldn't they? Grow up, you bunch of babies. Amen. Get right with God. Quit playing, a, playing with a ball and sucking your thumb all the time. Be a man. Stand up and go fight a real battle for the Lord. Go stand up. Go stand and rebuke them in the gate. That's what you need to do. Instead of going out and, 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 and supporting that garbage. You really, really seriously, you think I want to support these wicked men? Look what they do. They get millions of dollars, and they're a bunch of wicked, rotten, drunkards, drug addicts, steroid pe- people that are on steroids, sodomites, everything else. And you know what? Just go support them, right? Go, go. I'm not gonna, why do I want to make that guy make a million, help that guy make a million dollars? So he can continue in his sin and die and go to hell? Why should we do that? Why should we support that? Why would we want to be a part of any of that? It's foolishness. It's nonsense. It's a waste of life. But you know what? That's why we have our churches are in the shape they're in today. That's why they are. They're not sanctified. You've seen it. You're right. They're drunks. You, you know, if you look at it, if you look at it out there, when we go out there and we see all these people, we stand in front of these events and we're preaching the word of God to these people, trying to warn them. And they are scoffing and mocking. Listen, we're not even talking about football or baseball or any sports. We're, a lot of times we're just preaching the word of God. Don't say a word to them about it. Sometimes we do. I mean, that's fine. I don't care either way. It's, it's a bunch of childish garbage anyway. But, um, but when you're standing out there in front of there and you're preaching these people and you see like their, their attitude towards God, you see their attitude towards what they – some of the most dangerous, violent fans that we ever had, Brother Paul, was at that Gophers game those people were awful. They were downright wicked and despicable people. I mean, it was unbelievable what they did. They were so mad that their, their, their little team lost, you know, that they started attacking people. They were trying to go after the young people, the, the younger men. They were trying to go after that them. Right. Why? Because they're a bunch of wicked cowards, that's why. It's awful. But you know what? People will still love that stuff and support it. It just means you're not in the fight. That's why. Right. I like it when they call us fanatics. You guys are crazy fanatics. Well, probably not as crazy as you are. I feel kind of ashamed. I should be doing more. You know, I should probably be doing more because you guys, you look make us look pretty bad. You got your face all painted up. Right, and you're idolizing all these people. And, you know, you've got all your banners. But we're crazy, right? Because we have banners. Those signs don't work. Well, why do your banners work when you have them? Right? The big foam fingers, right? We need to get a big, a, a big preaching foam finger. 
All right, you just gave me an idea now. Yeah. <laughs> look at look at look at Gary. He's like, I don't think we need one of those. No, we need two of them. Not just one, two of them. King Jesus. Yeah, you might need that. It's kind of... <laughs> Amen. Hey, listen. You know what? I I've got some banners coming that are gonna and some signs. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I want them to be really, I, I want people to really read them. Why? Because I'm a, I'm a fanatic. Amen. You bet I am. You bet I'm following hard after Christ. Amen. Better believe it. By the grace of God Almighty. Leviticus chapter 26, verse number 3. 26, verse number 37. And they shall fall one upon another, as it were before a sword, when none pursueth. And ye shall have no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. Why? Well, if you hold sin in your heart, God told them that, you know what, you're not going to be able to stand before your enemies. And that's why half of Americans today that claim to be born-again Christians and in our Baptist churches, which I believe a lot of them are, they can't stand before their enemies. They've got, they're going to vote for their enemies. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Ted Cruz or Trump. You're going to vote for them, right? They'll vote for the very people that will enslave them. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I told them, spend all that energy. Stop wasting your energy on those people because they already know who's going to be president anyway. And go out and hold up a sign and go preach the word of God and warn sinners. Amen. The judgment is coming. That's what you need to do. But you go ahead and try to hold on to sit in your heart and be a warrior for the Lord, and you'll not be able to stand. You'll be, you won't be able to stand. That's inward sin and outward manifestations of sin. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass, and the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. His own children, and he's angry with them. God doesn't get mad. God doesn't get, well, he doesn't get mad, but he does get angry. God doesn't get angry. God loves everybody. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't get angry with anybody. Seriously, some, some lady last night came up to me, a charismatic lady from the Assemblies of God. Yeah, that was, that's what I said. And then she, she came up to me and she was like, you know, well, you, basically you guys are doing it wrong. It's like, yeah. And she said, and she looked at me and she said, you should be telling people that I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. I'm being very serious here. She said, you should tell people. That God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. <laughs> and I, I was like, I've always waited for people to say this to me. I was so shocked that she said it. I was like, she just told me I should be preaching that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. She really said that. Now, after I talked to her for 20 minutes and she was just being a manipulative Jezebel, I told her the truth. I said, lady, you're lost. You're lost. And she goes, I go, are you telling me you, I should be like Joel Olstein? She said, yes. I said, lady, you're lost. You're a Jezebel. And I don't want to talk to you anymore. You won't listen to sound reason. You don't care. You shouldn't say that. You know what she did after I said that? I won. Told you she was a Jezebel. Yeah. 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 No, she didn't care about the Bible. I kept giving her verses all over. Verses, verses. Continue to give her verses. I was quoting verse after verse after verse. She didn't care about that. No. Yeah, that's how she felt. That's what, a, that's, what Penteco- that's what a lot of Pentecostals and mostly Charismatics, that's what they do. Right. Is that what that is? Thank you. I don't know. I can't even say it. So anyway, God told him Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed. Look what God said to him, though. And the Lord said to Joshua, get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? How about that? So God says to us, dude, don't, you know, why are you lying on your face like moping like that? Get up. 
And the Lord said to Joshua, get thee up. Why? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. God says, you put it among your own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, look at this, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Listen, you ain't going to have any victory in your life. You'll see no power in your life till you take the accursed thing from you. And that's exactly what's going on. You know what? And that thing can be in your heart. That doesn't have to be an outward object. That thing is in your heart. Some people hold on to it, whether it's ought against your brother for, for a long time. That's an accursed thing. And you hold that in your heart for a long time, guess what it's going to do to you? Eat you up and destroy you. And you have no power. I've seen men that used to thunder out the truth and be bold, stand before people and mumble. And not even, what is that? It's because there's something wrong with your heart. That's why. You can blame everybody else you want to, but you know what? Let me help you. I'll spend a a couple dollars and I'll buy you a mirror, and that's the person you need to deal with. Amen. Amen. That's right, amen. That's the way it is. Because I'll tell you something, the greatest giants you'll ever face are the ones that are inside. It's the greatest giant you'll ever face. Listen, when you have the power of God, you don't stammer and stumble through things. Now, sometimes we don't, our words don't come out correct. What I'm saying is you are bold, and you look at somebody, and you just tell them how it is straight up. You tell them what you believe. You don't, you don't, you're not weak. You're not, you're not like nailing down jello, but you're, you're firm, and you're constant, and your heart is fixed, okay? And you know what you're saying is true. If you get sin in your lives, and you try to go out there and preach the word of God out there, we're going to fall on our faces. It's very dangerous. Let me, can I explain something to you, men? Let me, let me tell you something. It's very dangerous for you and I to harbor up sin. Because I'm going to tell you what, we go out on the devil's ground, and we go out and we war. And if we ain't got our, if our hearts are not right with God, we are in a dangerous place. God could allow, there's a lot that can happen to you out there. So you trying to scare me? Yes. You bet I am. I'm trying to. You don't have the protection of God on you. You get knifed in the stomach, man. Anything can happen to you. I've seen God miraculously defend us in a lot of situations. I've seen it. I've seen him protect us through it. But you know what? If you and I, don't, if you and I are not right with God and you and I harbor sin in our hearts and we hold on to bitterness, anger, wrath, malice, clamor, whatever it is, whatever the works of the flesh are, and we're not constantly repenting, that doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that, you know what, we get alone with God. We say, Lord, please forgive me. Help me to be stronger. Help me not to give in to these temptations. Help me to work through these things. Whatever the case may be, that's what it means. It doesn't mean we're sinless, but we should sin less. Amen. Amen. That's what it means. And it means that we battle. There's a war going on. But we're fighting. Listen, if you can't battle the, if you can't fight the battle in your heart, don't try to go out in the street and do it. And you'll get pummeled. And God will see to it that you get pummeled too, by the way. God will see to it that you do. Why? To humble you. So you go to him and you say, Lord, I need your strength. And I, Lord, I was wrong about this. Please forgive me. You can't have a warrior's heart if your heart is filled with sin. You can fast and pray and tell everyone you're doing it all you want to, but if you're holding out against somebody or if you're hiding sin in your heart, you're just starving yourself, and it's a vain exercise. That's all it is. It can be vanity. Amen. The Bible says, go leave thy gift and get it right with God, and then come back. Go get right with your man, and then come back. Then come back and do all those things. Amen? Right, exactly. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's the command of God, to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Listen, the most dangerous sins for the Christian warrior are the sins of the heart on the inside that do not manifest outwardly right away. It gives him a chance to fester and to hold on to them longer. 
The warrior's heart must be a, a holy heart, a sanctified heart. The command of the Lord in the Old Testament was be ye holy. The command of the New Testament hasn't changed. Be ye holy. That's not popular, is it? I'm sorry. You can't get out of that and say, well, that was another dispensation. No, that's all the way through the Bible. Be ye holy. Amen. God says, touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. Amen. That's what we have to do. Joshua chapter 5, verse number 13. Turn there, please. Look at this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with the sword, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went out unto him and said unto him, art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. When you and I battle for the Lord, it is a holy place. And it is for holy men. Amen. Amen. And if you don't want to be holy, then you don't want to battle the Lord's battles. Don't attempt to fight the Lord's battles when you love sin in your heart and you harbor it and you hold on to it and you will not war against it. You will not confess it and get it right. Why? Because you're on holy ground, that's why. We are on holy ground rather than when we serve the Lord. God wants his men to be holy. God wants his, the women to be holy. God wants children to be holy. Amen. That's what he desires for his children is to be holy. Why? Because the, the, as you and I sanctify ourselves, and by the way, we understand that God is the one, God is the sanctifier. Amen. But there is a duty that we have to be da- daily sanctified. Amen. Now, you can't do it without the power of God. A lost man can't sanctify himself. Only a saved man can. Why? Because he has the power of God in him. He has the Holy Ghost of God in him. It is God that sanctifies the man, but it is us that has to be obedient to that and separate ourselves and obey him and follow him. It's the power of God. But God expects you and I to live holy. It's already expected of you. It's commanded of you that you do and that I do. That means that we aren't, we aren't taken with the affairs of this life. We aren't, we aren't entangled by those things. We, no, they have no hold on us. We're dead men, right? We're dead men. It's a holy war, amen? But not like the Roman Catholic Church tries to make it, right? They're fighting a different war. They're fighting a war for the Antichrist because they are Antichrist. That's right, and that Pope is a wicked devil is what he is, and he's fighting it for the Antichrist, but he's fighting it in the flesh, and he will use the temporal power and any spiritual power that Satan gives him because it's not from God because they're Antichrist, and let him be accursed. Right. You, by the way, you can always trace where something is. If 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 you have a, a cult out there at a movement and they claim that they're against the Roman Catholic Church, but they use the same manuscripts as Rome, well, I guess you understand what spirit that's of, don't you? Right. Isn't that right, Brother Nathan? We were talking about that. Brother Nathan is doing some studying on that for the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Yeah, and they're and if you're using if you're using manuscripts from Rome, I think there's a problem there. Yeah, you might be in trouble, right? That's right. That's right. Number three, the warrior's heart is a contagious heart. Just like murmuring and complaining spreads like a plague, so does a warrior's heart to go and battle for the Lord. Caleb's example rubbed off on his brethren. Turn to Joshua chapter 15, and you're going to see this. Listen, you know what? If you start murmuring and complaining, yeah, you'll teach your kids murmuring and complaining. If you teach your children to war against the, uh, against the devil, then guess what you'll do? You'll teach them to war against the devil. If you war against the devil, they'll war against the devil. Amen? If you teach them, if you teach them, but if you teach them, it's okay to murmur and complain in your tents against the Lord, right? Against what God has done or against his church or anything else. Guess what happens? It rubs off. It rubs off. But so does the positive. Amen. So does that warrior spirit. Right? It encourages people. Listen, not everybody out there is lost. There's some saved people out there that they just need some encouragement. 
I talk to, I get emails from them all the time. And, and, and they just praise the Lord. They're like, you know, that encouraged me. I, I just, I, I want to do something for God now. And we know that because some of them are sitting in this room now. Because they watch this ministry. They watch what God has done in there. And they're like, you know what? I, I got to do this. I got to be a part of this. I got to do what God wants me to do. What is that? Well, it's contagious. It becomes contagious. Why? Because you have the same spirit. That's why. And you will naturally go where that, where you see that spirit of the Lord, that there's liberty, and you'll go there. Like, I want to see, I got to be a part of that. Joshua chapter 15, verse number 13. And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord, to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. By the way, you don't understand this possibly because you've not studied this out, but the city of Arba and Anak and all that around that area was a very high-level, occultic, wicked place. Very wicked. Arba was a great man. That doesn't mean what you think it means. The father of Anak... They, they were giants, okay? Yep. All right, they were giants. They were the leftover remnant of the giants. Very satanic, very wicked, very cultic. And what, yeah, mountain, right, the high place, that's right. And what did, what did Caleb say? Go right to the high place, let's tear it down. Amen. Amen! Go right to the high place. Where are we going here about the end of this month? We're going to the highest place in St. Paul. Right? And we're going to preach outside of that wicked place. That wicked Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Bunch of baby molesting wicked devils up there. Bunch of child molesters. That's exactly what they are. How many cases, brother? Hundreds? 400 cases? Reported. No. 400. Mm-hmm. Right. Bunch of wicked devils. What is it? It's a high place, though, isn't it? And they get away with it on this side. On this side. But Caleb said, no, give me that mountain, I'll take it. Joshua fifteen fourteen. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ammon, and Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Deber, and, named, and the name of Deber before was Kerjasifer. And Caleb said, he that smiteth Kerjasifer and taketh it, to him will I give Akash, A- Aksha, 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 my daughter to wife, whatever her name is, he wanted her to wife, he was going to give her to wife. And Othene, Othenil, the son of Kenneth, the brother of Caleb, took it. Why? Well, I guess, you know, he probably had a good example with Caleb, right? I mean, you don't think that rubbed off at all, that didn't encourage him? When he's seen, he seen this 80-year-old man cutting giants' heads off? Well, that's a little impressive, isn't it? The fact that he didn't waste any time, he went right for their high place and said, yeah, I'm going to chop their heads off. I'm going to take their land. I'm going to take everything they got. It's mine. I'm treading on it. Right? Because that's what God promised me. And it came to pass as she came unto him that his daughter moved, came unto him, he moved to him to ask her father of a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. You know, even his daughter had that warrior spirit. She wasn't going to be settled. She's like, well, yeah, you gave me the Lord. Give me the upper too. I want it all. Amen? She, she, was like, she had that same spirit. Why settle, right? Joshua chapter 14, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the Kenizzite, and said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Look at Caleb's spirit in Joshua 14, verse number 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land wherein thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, he said, now this is what Caleb said, Now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake the word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. I'm 85. As yet, now listen to what he said. 
As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war. Both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, wherefore the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If, if so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. What did he do? That's exactly what he did. 85 years old and drove them out and didn't even think twice about it that it was possible because he said, hey, the Lord said it and he'll be with me. I'm going. Turn to Judges chapter 3, though. Remember, remember Othniel or Othniel, however you say his name, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother that killed some, killed some giants there or killed and sl- uh, slew some of the land there and was able to uh, marry Caleb's daughter. You know what? Caleb's spirit that he had and his legacy, it didn't die out right there. Because in Judges chapter 3 and verse number 9, Israel was in trouble. And look what happened. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Kenaz Caleb's younger brother. What happened? It rubbed off. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Shushan Rish Thame, a Thame, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Shushan, Shushan Rish a Thame. Can you say it, Garrett? I can't either. I don't, Jacob probably can. Can you say it, Jacob? You don't want to right now? Oh, you just like me sounded funny, but you just like laughing at me. Okay, I see. I see how it is. This next time you guys laugh at me, I'm going to put you on the spot from now on. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> but notice what he said here. He said, in the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Ken, has died. You don't think that big brother Caleb, that 85-year-old, impacted that young man's life? What you and I do matters. It's contagious. What you and I do, the spirit that we have for our Lord God, the, the, the fact that we will stand for him in that warrior spirit, it becomes contagious. People see it and they're like, you know what? I want a war too for the Lord. I want to do things for God. Amen? That's what happens. Is that what he says? With, with my dad? Yeah, you see Paul's preaches on that street with that old man. Is that what he says? Yeah, amen. That's right. But you know what? It took God to do a work in his heart for him to do that. And it was totally against what he was used to because he's not, he wasn't used to being bold like that and standing up and saying things like that to people and doing that. But you know what? When God starts to work in your heart, you see, you're, it's never too late to serve God. As long as you've got breath in, the, in this life, then you can serve God. It's never too late to do something for God. It's never too late to get up and, 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 and uh, follow the Lord Jesus Christ and obey his word. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it's time to do something for God. He could spend out the rest of his years serving God no matter how long that is. I pray God gives him a lot, a lot many years to do that. That. Amen. And it's a blessing to be able to see that. I thank God for that. I never thought that would happen. You know? Of course, I never thought I'd be preaching on the streets either, but, uh, but I never thought that would happen. But you know what? God does a work. And you can't use age as an excuse. Well, I'm tired. I'm this. I'm that. You know what? Everybody's tired. It's a long battle. It's a long war. But we still got to be faithful to God. We still got to continue on for the Lord. And when we have opportunity, then we do what the Lord wants us to do. You know, when these other brethren, they see this, it encourages them to go, go to war right where they are and preach, the, and preach in war for the Lord, to fight hard against sin and wickedness and preach the word of God and warn sinners of their impending doom. Next, the warrior's heart is always at war. Listen, you're, that's the one thing. You can't stop fighting. These pastors say, well, it's time for me to retire. No, there's no such thing as that. You don't retire. This is not a job. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's like, what's your career? Well, I don't really have a career. I have a calling. I mean, I don't. I don't really have a career. I don't think of it as a career. You know. Yeah, I don't have a four hundred one k plan or a pension plan. They're gonna steal it anyways. <laughs> I've got the I've got the Elijah plan. Hey, Beth. I've got the ravens and the crows and the and everything else will come and feed you. Hey, Amen. And he always has. Hey, Amen. He always has, and he always will by the grace of God. Why? Because he's faithful. That's why. And I trust him. And the children of Joseph. But you know what? The warrior's heart is always at war. Turn to Joshua chapter 17, verse number 14. I think I'm almost done. Wow, this is longer than I thought. Always is, though. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, all you're going to do is go home and take a nap anyway after you ate all that food. So, <laughs> Joshua chapter 17, verse number 14. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people? For as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto... And Joshua answered them, if thou be a great people, I like this, I like how he answered them, seeing how we're a great people, Joshua says, okay, big boy, if thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyselves there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Well, keep fighting. Who told you to give up? You want more? Go take more. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Bethshean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even unto Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter the obstacle. It doesn't. We have to pray and seek God's face and obey him and continue on for the Lord. That's what we have to do. Right? It doesn't matter how big the mm-hmm. You know, when I was sent to Northfield, it was hard. it's hard. Well, I know. I mean, he didn't send me because it was going to be easy. Right? But it's hard there. It's hard anywhere. I mean, you're battling the devil in his kingdom. What did, you, did you think it was going to be easy? I mean, in the beginning, I thought we'd, you know, it'd be a little bit easier. Some cookies, and you'll be good. It didn't work. But you know what? We had to keep fighting. We had to keep battling and keep trusting the Lord. That's what we have to do every day. We can't stop. If you stop fighting, if you become satisfied with your spiritual walk and you settle for having some sin in your life, if you settle on past spiritual victories, you will cease to be the warrior that God wants you to be and trouble will come your way. Judges chapter 1 shows us that they had some trouble come their way. And why is that? Because they stopped fighting. Judges chapter 1 verse number 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. What happened? They didn't drive them out. What ended up happening to them? They were pricks in their eyes and thorns in their side, right? That's what happened. Why? Because they didn't drive them out. And God just told them, Joshua told them, go up there and drive them out. Well, they they didn't. They didn't drive them completely out. That's what happens when you and I leave things undone. Amen? You can't leave them undone. 
Never stop fighting the flesh, the world, and the devil. Never give it the devil a place. Victory is ours in Christ Jesus. We've been promised victory. Joshua chapter 10, verse number 24 says this, And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said to them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. The Lord will also give the better land to the ones who are willing to fight for it. If you look at it, they got the ones who are willing to fight for it. There was a lot to, for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, to wit, for Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilad, because he was a man of war. He was a man of war, so God sent him. He said, okay, I'm going to send him because he's a man of war. He'll fight. You know, God will send you where he knows you're supposed to be and where, where he knows he wants you to be and, and where you'll fight. Why didn't God send the more intelligent, more smarter, sophisticated preacher to Northfield? Because he wouldn't have fought. That's why. He wouldn't have fought. Because this is where God wanted me. Because you fight. He sent him where he could fight. But God knows what's best. Because he fits you. He equips you for where he wants you. Amen? Amen? And it takes a stubborn person to, pre- to preach around here. Amen. Your forehead has to be harder than their forehead. Yep. And God sent more hard-headed men <laughs> with foreheads that are hard. Hard-headed in more ways than one. <laughs> we'll work on that, though, but anyway. <laughs> But amen, you know what? He sends them there, and he sent them there. He sent you here. Why? Because he knew you'd fight. He knew you'd be willing to war. And that you needed the edification of the saints. You needed to be strengthened by other brethren. You needed the encouragement to be strong and of good courage. You needed that. We all need that. I need that from you. We need to encourage one another. We need each other. Joshua chapter 18, verse number 2. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long, and this is the question I want to leave you with, How long are you slack to go possess the land which the Lord your God, the Lord God of your fathers, hath given you? Slackers, that's right. How long halt you between two opinions? As a good soul, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know what? How long are you slack to go take the land? That's it. The battles that you face, every single person's room has a spiritual battle they're facing, or maybe a few of them right now. But how long before you attack it? How long before you attack it and deal with it? And get it right with God, whatever it is. Whatever the challenge is, whether it's parental, whether it's a husband and wife, whether it's you know church, whether it's whether, whatever it is, how long before you attack it and war against it and knock the giant down? Remember the violent take it by force. Amen. Be strong and of good courage. That's the warrior's heart. Father, Lord, thank you, thank you for this day, thank you for your people, and Lord, thank you for the encouragement that they bring. To me as well, Lord, and and I just pray that we'd be obedient to you and follow you in all things, Lord, that we would not back down, that we would not back up, that we would not turn around and go the other way, Lord, but we would be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for we know that our labor is not in vain. Help us, Lord God, please help us to be strong, Lord. Forgive us for our failures. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, that we commit, that we fail you in, Lord, and help us to stand up and obey you and follow you. Help us have a heart to confess and repent anything to you and get it right because of your promises, Lord, that we will go take the land, that we will, be, we will have good success if we keep thy word hidden in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. Help us, Lord. Bless this week. Thank you so much for everybody here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.